Yeah. Okay, awesome. <clears throat> See you. Hey, good evening, everyone, and welcome to Artists Talk on Art. Thank you so much for joining us for this Monday, June 6th. Tonight, we have an open studio program. My name is Kristen Eichenberg, and I'm the program coordinator here at Artists Talk on Art, and I'll be moderating tonight. So I'm so excited that we have uh, a lot of new audience members and participating artists with us here tonight. So I'd like to give them all a special, special welcome and thank you uh, for all the artists offering their time and efforts to participate in tonight's program. Tonight we'll be viewing works from Jacqueline Sferrarada, Timothy Hull, Andre Emmerich, Nina Kuo, Lauren Rosser, Scott Keenan, Elsa Hammerin, Jonathan Wosu, Mark Josloff, Mariana Kaplan, hopefully, and Josh Davis. So the program is being recorded, as you see, and all the right series are available to A. We will later have this program available on our YouTube channel, which I'll provide a link to in the chat. So this is actually our last program before we take our summer recess. Um, our recess will be from next week, June, to the first week of September. And we'll be resuming our programming back on September 12th with a panel by Fran Beeler. And some exciting news is that we'll be returning to in-person talks starting on October 3rd in Greenwich Village every Monday of the month at 7 p.m. So stay tuned for that. If you haven't already, you can go to www.a2anyc.org to join our newsletter and get all the updates. So for tonight, um, our open studio is an opportunity for artists to display and talk about their artworks in a non-curated manner. It's essentially an open screening that invites visual artists to share a combination of recent works, ongoing works, works in progress. So again, in recognition of our first time participants tonight, I wanted to offer a brief intro to Artists Talk on Art we're a nonprofit art organization founded in New York City in 1974 by Douglas Shear, Laurie Ansachi, and Robert Wiegand. Our mission is to provide artists a platform to share their thoughts and opinions for critical dialogue in the arts on issues relevant to the contemporary context and for historic review. Our historical archive of talks and panels are held at the Smithsonian Archives of American Art. So thank you again to all the artists here tonight who are presenting their works and for their valued contributions to our historical legacy. So with 11 artists tonight, we're gonna try to do eight minutes per presentation. Our program runs 90 minutes, so we'll be wrapping things up around 8.30. Um, for the audience, please feel free to add your questions and comments to the chat feature in Zoom, and we'll, we'll get to those after our artists are finished with their presentations. So as your name appears on the slide, artists just um, unmute your mic and then you can play next slide when you're ready to move on to the next image. So with that, we'll start, oops, we'll start with Jacqueline. Hi, Jacqueline. Hi, good to be here, thank you. Um, yeah. Are we gonna put my slides up or how are, we, how are we doing this? I'm sorry. Yes. Oh, okay, so I let me just uh, introduce myself as a uh, painter work on paper. Normally I do uh, works, acrylic glazes on gessoed papers. Uh, what these, what I'm showing tonight, however, will be just what I'm doing in my studio right now. They're nine by 12 and they, they're on um, bristle vellum, which I love. And I, I just started using these um, watercolor pencils just because, I don't know, I was looking for something to doodle around with while I'm thinking about more, you know, larger works. And I started to, so the other thing I wanted to say is I spent almost living on the beach during COVID, literally, I don't know if you saw my back that was up on the screen before that's where my apartment is right smack on the sand so I was on the beach literally every single day 
walking, looking at the sky uh, in all kinds of weather. And I think, you know, now that I'm back in my studio for six months, this is what's sort of coming out of me. And, you know, I, I think these will become larger works later. But for the moment, I'm just really enjoying, um, you know, doing all these images. So while my work is grounded in reality, it does, um, you know, include, it is sort of minimal um, and it, it's also uh, kind of remembrance, you know, it, it's not done on the spot, but I'm using what, I, you can go to the next slide actually, uh, but I'm using the, the feelings and emotions I had while I was experiencing uh, some of these um, images. And this one, for instance, um, there are these rain clouds in the distance where I was, it was not raining, but way in the distance, there were these large clouds and you could actually see the rain coming down. I just love that image. So I've done a, you know, quite a few of these. I'm just showing one right now. Um, anyway, you can go to the next one. Next, another, another rain cloud. Um, and obvious, and the colors, while they're not 100% accurate they're very close okay i wasn't ready for this one yet but i'll, I'll talk about it so the next thing i started to uh, wait can we just not go so fast all right all right all right all right i was i was just finishing up these are the pencil the watercolor pencil um so i don't it's something i've never used before and i find them really fun and fascinating okay we could go to the next one now this is a a pastel so there's no watercolor pencil involved here and this again is that rain cloud image that i just was so fascinated with um we can go to the next one and this is um a shore i did a lot of well, doing a lot of um images about the shoreline and this was at a sunset where the light was just completely gold um on the water and next. Okay, same. This is also, oh, so on the last two, it was watercolor pencil and then I work over it with pastel. So, you know, who knows what'll happen next. So I'm really having fun with these and they possibly will become large paintings at some point. I don't know the way I work really has a lot to do with um, my inner, you know, feelings um, that I get from, I don't know, I'm not being very articulate with this, I'm trying to, when I see something I, I want to record, it's because it, it brings up some emotion. So I either take a photo of what I, a part of it that I think I want to use or make a small sketch. Then when I go back to my studio and it could be, you know, like some of these were, you know, weeks ago, but I still have the feeling, I'm working from the feeling and the response that I got originally. If that goes away, then they're just pictures I have, but I can't really do anything with them. So these, I, as I said before, after spending literally 21 months <laughs> on the beach, it's all stuck in there and now it's coming out and, um, and it's great. I really, I feel good, I like it. Um, Anyway, so, so my whole theme, theme here is um, to bring my response to these, of these experiences uh, to a place that's not exactly real. It's a combination of realism, illusion, memory, um, imagination, and also like the astonishment that I I felt when I saw these particular images, you know, bring that into, none of this is like totally conscious. I mean, I'm just telling you how I'm thinking about it after I've done it, but while I'm doing it, you know, I don't know, I'm just doing it. So, um, Can I, ask I think what, that, that's all. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah, well, yeah. What, what beach are you, where you working? Oh, well, well, I grew up in, I live in Manhattan and I, was brought up in Brooklyn and Long Beach. So I've been in Long Beach since I'm a child and I'm fortunate enough to have a small apartment there where I can, you know, just drop in and out. And my family lives out there. 
but I was really blessed during COVID, as I said, to be able to leave Second Avenue where I was locked up and, and go to my other, they're both small apartments, but the beauty of this one is that it's literally on the sand. So, I mean, I could just run back and forth to the beach like two or three times a day. And sometimes I do. So anyway, <laughs> on that, that's, yep. These were really, yeah, I, I love the, the depth you got with those in the, the watercolor pencil and pastel, I think is such a good combination. Yeah. And that was just a discovery, you know, that um, very often what has happened to me when I'm sort of in the middle of not doing anything specific, I'll go to my studio and, you know, just start doodling on something. Or like I said, I just picked up these, yeah, I've had these boxes on my shelf for years. I've never used them. And there it was, it was so much fun. And then put the, putting the, now I'm really doing all of them um, starting with the watercolor pencil and then pastel over them. And I really like the effects that I'm getting and I don't know, just having a good time. <laughs> any, any, any other questions or comments before I say goodbye? <laughs> Perhaps as I didn't check the chat. But. I think that was my last one, wasn't it? Or, yeah. Um, yeah. And Thank you so much. Your work really is beautiful, Jacqueline. Thank you. Thank you You're very welcome. much. The mm. brushwork and the use of color is really, really, really well done. These are like, mm. and, oh, I, lo and I love you. how the, the the direction of the storms that were coming out uh, on the ones prior, like, yeah. I could tell like it was the water dripping down, but it was also like representing water dripping down. But uh, uh -huh. that was really cool. Well, I really, I really got into, you know, I, that the materials really um, were, were excellent for, you know, this, this whole rain theme and storm theme. And it was just kind of an accident, but isn't that always the way artists, I guess the, the thing about accidents, I was just saying this to one of my young nieces over the weekend, who's an aspiring designer, accidents happen, but the, the thing is to recognize that they might be good and, you know, work with them. And I think that's kind of what happened with me with the pencils on these other ones that you referred to. Anyway, thank you. Yeah, oops, something went off. Okay, thank you so much, Jacqueline. Thank Next, you. Timothy, Timothy Hall. Let's go to your first slide. I think you're on mute. Though. Am I? Oh, no, I was. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Hi. Uh, first, I want to thank Kristen for inviting me to do this. I really appreciate your interest in my work and following up with me. And we had sort of been in a little bit of a momentary conversation uh, because I just had a solo exhibition in the Lower East Side at Ashes Ashes Gallery and it closed maybe about a month ago now. And it was up through mostly March and April. And the show is titled Plato's Closet, which if any of you are familiar with that title, it's actually the name of a thrift store sort of upcycling shop, like a chain of shops. And I remember seeing one of these shops many years ago in Ohio and thought, that is a very evocative title. I'm going to put that in my back pocket and sort of let that percolate in my life. And when I was working on this new body of work for this exhibition specifically, when I started to think about what I wanted to title the whole body of work, Plato's Closet really spoke to me very loudly because I was really interested in the idea of the closet as multiple metaphor, like a closet is a place where you stuff items. A closet is also a place where you hide. If you're playing hide and go seek or if you're gay and you're not out, you're in the closet. So I felt like there was something very cheeky about that idea. And also the idea of Plato's cave, which you know many artists work with and know about that idea of sort of this allegory of images and how we read images and live through images. And so to me, this title, Plato's Closet for an art exhibition was just totally spot on. 
and 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 the work in the show is all um, what I consider to be a discursive style of painting, which is something I've been working with with for a while. But this new body of work is all uh, in this sort of mode of discursiveness, which discursive means meandering or or wandering or sort of haphazard one thing leading to another. And when I started to think about what I was doing with the imagery in my work, I thought, well, there's something very discursive about the way that I'm placing objects on top of each other, reminiscent of a bulletin board, reminiscent of some kind of inspirational board, but also is how I, I collect images and then sort of upcycle them, so to speak. So that, that was very interesting for me in terms of like a Plato's closet. And most of the imagery I work with is classically based, mostly Hellenistic, but I do inject a lot of pop culture elements into it, sort of clashing the past with the present sort of in this tableau of imagery. So you can go to the next slide. So that first one, it was the only light colored background. All the other ones were in Payne's gray and Portland gray light as the sort of background foreground. And they're all oil on canvas. They're all large scale paintings. This one is six feet tall. So it's a very immersive, I mean, on the screen, it looks of course small, but in real life, it's sort of life size. And, and, there, and there's, so there's something very immersive about it. When you go up to it, you can, you can get lost in these images that are all sort of in this dance and, and layering. And although the work looks very graphic and flat, it's actually highly textural. And unfortunately, I don't have a detail image, but I, there's a lot of impasto on this painting. So there's sort of a visual trick where it appears quite flat in a graphic image, but in real life, it's very lush and very oil painty and, and has all these sort of glowing textures to it. Unfortunately, the image doesn't really do much justice to that. Um, and the way that I work is sort of in a discursive way. I do not make these in Photoshop beforehand. I don't know how to do Photoshop. And it's sort of a ruse because everyone automatically thinks these are sort of heavily Photoshop type of images, but I'm playing with that language of Photoshop, but in an extremely sort of old fashioned pinup kind of way where I start with a large canvas and all these cut pieces of blank paper and I lay it all out compositionally and then I decide what images go into them as I sort of work and meander through the painting. And the painting really makes itself. I don't, I do very little image planning. It just sort of like calls to me what image needs to be in a certain spot. And uh, I, I guess I'll just talk about this one painting for a second more before we move on, because the faces are theater faces. They're, they're from ancient Greek theater. And I was really interested. I, I've been reading Nietzsche's Birth of Tragedy, and I was really taken with the idea of the Dionysian tragic theater. And I had come across these masks, which were these screaming masks, which were reminiscent of sort of existential dread that I feel like we're all feeling with COVID and the whole world. And I, I wanted to play with this idea of how we're all wearing masks as well, like on our faces. And also this idea of the mask, like that Carl Jung talked about that, that we all wear this persona. So there's lots of crap packed, <laughs> packed into these paintings. So we can move on to the next one. So this is another example of the Payne's gray background, which ends up being very navy blue and very matte. So the background is extremely matte. The images are very impasto and sort of wet looking. So in real life, it's a very um, lush surface from very matte to very impasto. And so I'm interested in painterly surfaces. To me, painting is about an active surface. So to me, it's very, it's, it's in the plastic art. So I wanna move things around. I play with different paint textures. I paint with different fields of vision, overlapping images. So that's sort of that idea of the discursive 
painting. I think I perhaps have one more. So these these sort of images come come back up and they get recycled. A lot of images of Dionysus. I was interested in the pre-Socratic uh, cults, um, mystery cults, the pre-Socratic mystery cults, which all come uh, in in really ancient Greece, which were these philosophical, religious, spiritual groups that grew up around the deities. And I researched a lot about the images they use, the objects they use. So you see a lot of ritual imagery that to the sort of uninitiated, you would just think it's a, it's a vase, but, but a lot of the vase images come from Dionysian rites. And so I'm mixing that sort of really super ancient antiquity imagery in a sort of more pop contemporary sensibility, which to me that mashup becomes like a telephone line through time. And I'm in a sort of conversation with writings and images that were used by humans thousands of years ago, and I'm still sort of working through them. And to me, as sort of this idea of collective unconscious is very evocative and, and provocative. And I think that's sort of all I have to say about them. Thank you. Yeah, it's so nice to hear about it um, from your own perspective. Since I, you know, I've been so interested that I hadn't really known so much about your work, but to see, yeah, to hear about like all the, the layers of meanings with the mask. And I'm wondering if if the figures are, if it's just Dionysus and Apollo or there's other Greek gods. Or oh, there's gods. lots of other Greek images. Most there's like uh, Orpheus and there's um, Oedipus and different sort of archetypal images that I'm working with. And I've been working with classical imagery for the last decade or so in different sort of formats and, and working with sometimes very big, iconic, just solid colored vases. And then other times these more discursive imagery and sometimes just very textural monochromatic paintings, but that reference Greek patterns and imagery. So had a lot of different ways of working with image and surface over the last, I don't know, maybe 15 years that I've been professionally working and showing. Yeah. I wish I could see the textures. Yeah, me too. Yeah, that it is sort of a shame of the of the imagery, especially because the paintings are so big that when you have a, a an image yeah. on the screen, you can't you can't really see at all what the. But most of those solid colors you see on there that are like are actual like heavily impasto with little marks, little teeny uh, textured brush marks that capture the light in different ways. Nice. I you feel I don't know how to give you like my Instagram thing, but but on there I usually have like sort of closer up images and maybe on the gallery website there were some detailed images and stuff. For some reason I would I mean I keep noticing this guy. And I've seen this before. Oh, that's the Gorgon face. What was that? It's called the Gorgon face. It was originally a it was it's where the Medusa head comes from, but originally it was a male face and it's sort of transgendered over the course of a thousand years into a woman's face, which is also why I use that face because I like the idea of, of this sort of trans person through a millennia. You know, we yeah. think trans is so in right now and it's some new thing, but mm -hmm. really transgender has been around for thousands of years in mythology and also in real. Yeah, yeah especially in different Eastern religions too. Mm -hmm. A quick question. Medicine too. Yeah, what was that, Mark? Yes, I have a quick question. Um, it's when did you first get uh, become intrigued with Greek, uh, with ancient Greek culture? Something must have sparked it at some point. Well, the the really shortest answer to that is I used to make my. I started my art life and career making work about uh, G. I. Gurdjieff, the the mystic, and he had said that if you want the answers to everything, go back to Egypt. So I took a trip to Egypt and I started making artwork about Egypt. And then when I started to research more into Egypt, it led me into ancient Greece. And that's where my 
interest in philosophy from when I was an undergrad at NYU sort of met my art interests in terms of philosophy and art and imagery and mythology. And it sort of all attracted me in this sort of like hot energy around it. Great, thanks, Tim. The Birth of Tragedy is a, is a great read. It for... is one of my favorite. I read it in college and I just reread it right before yeah. and when I was working on this stuff and it totally still blows my mind. Yeah, I just gave it to my friend and I'm not getting it back anytime soon. <laughs> get get another copy. Yeah, it's, it's great. Thank you so much, Timothy. Okay, we have Andrea next. Oops, sorry. Let's go right to the first one, I guess. Hi. Can you hear me okay? Um, so first of all, thank you for asking me to join this. Um, I couldn't have come at a better time because I do feel like I need like ar artist advice. <laughs> like I only want to talk to artists right now because I, I recently had a big switch in my practice. So I'm working and painting in, a, in East Williamsburg area, Brooklyn. And um, my studio is very small. So I, had, I knew I needed to learn how to draw. And so that was one of the, the bigger changes recently because I'm filling up my studio with these huge canvases. But I used to make really uh, photo realist, not photo realistic, but it was, it was like oil painting, very uh, rendered and real. And I had a just a two complete switch, which I'm sure a lot of you can relate to, but this was definitely the biggest uh, switch up I've had yet. Um, but I'm trying to just ride it out and be open to it, but I'm kind of abstract. It still has a lot of elements. This is a small drawing, very small. So this is marker um, and a little pen on paper. This is about like five and a half by five and a half. So it's a very small square sketchbook that I'm just like, I bought, I've already gone through like three of these because I'm just kind of like getting all this out. But um, this sort of, sh you see the, the half circle shape with the blue dots that kind of became my shape I'm working with that I got kind of stuck on and Basically, if you put two circles together and connect them, you get that blip kind of long oval shape airplane window thing. So those have definitely captured my attention and I'm just sort of seeing like what they are, why, you know, why that? Sorry, my dog is whining. So this one is, is, is fun. I do a lot of these kind of upside down um, I like to flip and make this sort of upside down world with the, the top world and see if I can figure out how to not have like a traditional landscape. But um, yeah, I'm just, it's, it's very new for me. So we'll see. I just had a show with this work too, which was exciting because people seem to like resonate with the change, but it's just very different for me. Um, yeah, I see you said Gustin. That's definitely an influence. But yeah, cartoonish because the black line. Okay, you can go to the next one. This is me trying to then take these small drawings and scale them up. So learning how to paint these has been interesting because I felt like I was losing something with the painting. Um, so what I ended up doing was mm. painting pretty big. So that, that painting is a smaller one. That one's 36 by 36. That's cool. Um, but the other ones I've been doing are about four by five feet, and that's where I'm more comfortable because my art desk has a lot of texture. See in the background, there's kind of this texture with the uh, brown. Um, and then I also am using a paint marker that I carved off the chisel tip, and I made it really rough. I hate neat chisel tips. I wanted something that's not a paintbrush. It's not a oil stick, but it's a a marker I can just go fast kind of like how I do with the drawings so it's been interesting because as you know like when you're when you're working uh small you know it's it's easier to get like little movements with the hands and everything but then when you scale up it's a little bit more complicated oh it looks like everyone's losing my voice I'm so sorry <clears throat> can you guys hear me okay 
possibly. I think it goes in and out. I think your mic gets a little bit covered, but I can hear you now. All right, you can go to the next one though. Um, let's see. So this is uh, four by five feet. And that actually is a digitally edited, that's all an oil painting, but then I added in the black marker looking lines on the right side and on the bottom of the tail digitally. Because again, this is me trying to discover like, how can I get more texture on these larger paintings? How can I get line work? And I'm thinking I might have to use oil stick. I didn't want to because it's so messy and, and difficult, but I might. Because um, I definitely don't want to do that with paint marker. But anyway, so this is kind of a mermaid, goldfish sort of thing. Um, and again, that one's pretty big. So that's four by five feet. And that's, I like that, but I want to figure out how to work a little smaller. Um, so then if you want to go to the next one, this is uh, again, a small five by five tornado piece. Um, again, I'm using trees, I'm using things in our real world, but I'm kind of experimenting with just a few things at a time. I'm not going on to everything, but trees are definitely big. Um, anything in nature is, it's kind of starting to come in. So the tornado, and then you can go to the next one too. Let's see. Um, oh, this is, yeah, I was studying flags a lot. So this is about 48 by 48 inches and abstract, fully kind of an abstract one, but Definitely was looking at flags, looking at crosses, looking at the shortened cross, just because it takes it away from like a little bit of the Christianity element and brings in like emergency or like nurses or something like that, or like a flag, like the country flag. Um, but stars are always good. I like stars because they do remind me of flags, but at the same time, they're part of nature. Um, yeah, you can go to the next one. I think I have a couple, probably too many. Oh, this is the full kind of my studio shot. So you can see the scale, how small the drawing is on the left. Then we've got the oil painting. That one, again, is kind of small for me because it's just hard for me to shrink up oil painting. And then on the right, I'm just drawing really fast on some paper too. Um, do I have another one? I think this is your last one. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, your last one. So I don't know how, how long I have, but yeah, basically I'm, I'm really working on adding things in slowly, like different elements slowly. I don't wanna get too busy and complicated, but I know being too minimal is kind of hard for me as well. So I'm kind of just like feeling it out. Can it just, the, and I'm sure you guys know too, it's like you make up these rules. So it feels like, oh, like I'm allowed to have a tree, but can I have a bush? Like, I don't know, I can't fully do that yet like there's these rules you make up and you feel it out and so I'm kind of pushing it but also pushing my abstraction and mm -hmm. definitely drawing is uh, financially amazing and I feel really happy I have a way of drawing that I feel like the drawings really like land on their own but I can just go all day in the studio just drawing drawing yeah, that's that's so liberating to just like give yourself, you know, the freedom to just like go back to, you know, like one one medium and like expand and like start small and then work big and just be yeah, playful. Like some of your, you know, like realistic, like really like photorealistic like techniques in your oil paintings. So when I started seeing these, it was so exciting. I'm just like it, it's a little shocked, but <laughs> It, it's this like inventive, like kind of like pop iconography sort of thing. But then it's like, it, you have this like strangeness in this, like, you know, you say minimal, but it's also very retinal and bright. And it's just a lot of movement and the variety and like the sheer variety of like using these kind of like symbols you've made, like the, the blip you talk about, um, you know, Richard Archwager. Yeah, it's like reminds me of that blip. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't know the name for it, and then my friend Robin sent me his work, and I was like, "It's a blip." So I was like, "Okay, that's what we call it." Blip, because I forgot 
the name of it too until you said it but i i love that they're kind of like they're these like perfect blips and then they become you know wonky and distorted in other applications and yeah i just love we're definitely focusing on the thing oh. that nipples in the beginning too they were like oh it's a nip it's a boob it's a you know and i saw eyes and i see nips sometimes but i think there's they're becoming a lot more ways to look at it i guess but yeah whatever you want to see yeah they have this like universal application where they just like enter different scenes and objects and characters really it's just like its own character which i love yeah, yeah. it does feel like it's taking on a, it has a little soul or it's i don't know if it's an animal a person what but it's yeah yeah, yeah. Well, it's a it's a good place to be showing it because, of course, you're surrounded by artists here. Who I know. Thank you so much. It's so nice. There's an enigmatic quality to these that's deeply charming. Um, yeah, I, I'm so I'm so glad you showed these. It's, it's really nice to see them more in depth. Oh, Mark, did you have a question? Sorry, what was that? I think Mark was raising his hand. Oh, sorry. I think your mic's muted, Mark everyone at once so please yeah, I'm, I'm messing up the uh, chat process so i'll just talk like okay. an old-fashioned human being um yeah. what, I, what i'm intrigued with is that you take these simple very rigid shapes which are part of a family that you use over and over again and you use an, um, a painterly process to put them on the on the paper or the canvas and the contrast of the two the loosey-goosey against the rigid I find uh, very well balanced. I do, you know, if you if you went one in a different direction, it wouldn't be quite as intriguing as it is right now. But yeah, because that's where I'm kind of balancing. How tight do I get, and then where do I be loose, and and why, or you know, so I'm kind of using that black line and and the mop brush to get that loose texture. But there's still definitely I I'm pretty tight painter person so yes, yes. that's going to come through i think like no matter what but well they say everybody has a left brain and a right brain and you made you harmonize you made them work together right yeah, yeah the marker i that's such a good idea just cut off have you been like experimenting with different markers and like cutting yeah so i i tried for a while to see if i could paint these but you know when you're using an oil paint with a brush you're going so slow like you can't just unless I got it really sopping wet with a really thin down ink but then I'd be dripping you know so I needed something that had speed but like was not um not as an oil stick but I might try I don't know they're just so messy I don't know but so I, yeah I bought these cheap uh oil paint markers from Amazon used a razor and just cut off the chisel tip and kind of made it rounded and you can buy them pretty big too and you can make, make any shape you want I can make triangles you know just cut it up mm -hmm. um so that's what's helped help me get looser because at first when I went from the drawings to the paintings I was way too tight they were horrible and I didn't know how to kind of get that same flick of your wrist when you're drawing mm -hmm. definitely material trial and error Oh, sorry. You're, I think your mic's covered again. Sorry. It's probably my Wi-Fi. I'm in Ohio right now, so we don't know. Yeah, my Wi-Fi is weird in New York here, too. So no worries. But thank you so much. It was so cool to see these. Thank you. Um, we, know. we have Nina next. Hello. Hi, Nina. Oh, thank you, everybody. This is so um, enthralling on a Monday evening. Oh, yeah, this is my latest painting. It's called uh, Peace Soldier. Um, I, I've been feeling really weird lately, uh, similar to everyone else uh, around the world. Um, my new work is trying to define uh, images that are, are uh, built on the pressures of the issues and controversies of uh, what's going on in the times. 
Uh, today, I feel there's uh, pressure um, by, I guess, the personal reflections and emotions and personal purposes of how to deal with, um, you know, I, I guess certain people that I knew have passed away. Um, so it, it, it's been an impact. Um, so I, I felt that I needed to expand um, this kind of self uh, image that, you know, when you paint or you work with uh, your art, you see yourself in it. And next, so, oh, next, yeah. So here, I, I wanted to show some beauty, but also some kind of like the kind of stark, oh, oh if you go back, yeah, here's the detail of the first painting. Um, the kind of grotesque, and, and I love the um, German um, kind of like uh, George Gross and uh, uh, post-war people. Um, I, I, I felt I, I, I wanted to capture that kind of um, the dark side of life, but, um, but also it, I wanted like images to, 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 to make, um, make you kind of like look and, and think um, you know, what's going on and confuse people maybe um, in some ways because, you know, every day is pretty confusing, I think. Um, you know, if you're in a city, it, it, it's pretty, uh, I think uh, for a lot of us, it's um, not so peaceful. <laughs> and um, next, I made these, these, these next ones um, from like, like, my images of uh, being, um, I guess, um, building on like a sketchbook of uh, strokes of, of clay and, and little faces that I see in crowds. And um, I wanted to play with um, uh, sculpture and um, painting on, on, on clay and fabric and collage them all together. And then I made these little installations and, um, Next, and, and I, I didn't really want to talk so much. Um, I wanted to show again that um, that art is also about like the kind of things that we look at all the time, which is fashions, body parts, uh, facial expressions. Um, and, and for me, it, it took me a long time to be happy with how to make a face and how to, uh, you know, like, after art school, you 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 learn all the, the 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 anatomy and you know, but then you have to unlearn the anatomy because you know the anatomy doesn't really look the way you want it to look, and our bodies always um, get funky, you know. So I I, sh I put that together in, in this um, it's like a, a photo, it, you know, it's got many layers. It's a photo of clay and collage and paint and text and and that's the title you know oh thanks doug <laughs> uh, for your comment um and for me uh next these emotional portraits are um kind of like uh maybe the haunting ancestral part of us and here i have this like zigzaggy uh face and you know the the the, the it, it could be a woman, it could be a little boy, or it could be a man or a woman. And I, I kind of always like that that kind of um, interplay because um, I wanted it to emphasize that that art is inherently beautiful. It has some of its own beauty. It has to have this enigma of the forms and your your own gestures. And how do you how do you invent that? Um, you need to explore your values. And it's, it's pretty uh, painful, I think, for me, you know, to, to be sitting there making all this. And I, I relate to everyone else's experiences because uh, your, your, your sense of um, digging into the technical range from, you know, trying to get the bold colors to, to making the exaggerations um, to, uh, you know, trying to make things uh, fictional for me. And, and um, I worked on a uh, video with my partner on um, uh, a statement about war, you know, and people look at it and, and we were rejected 
from all these festivals because I think people didn't understand that, um, you know, that, that maybe we, we wanted to say that it was um, the horrors of war, but there's also uh, the person that, that's brave and has a, a loneliness and the lingering kind of feeling is, is, is uh, has its own sense of uh, dignity. You know what I mean? Um, that's, that's how I guess uh, we are today. I mean, I, I feel that's where I am today. And next, and, and then I made this, this kind of threw it in because it, I, I felt like uh, here it's a, a, a clay head that um, is instilled into this uh, fashion shoe and, and it's, it's gold. And, and it, it's kind of like this kind of like uh, society we're in where it's, you know, uh, we're, we got to be in this glamorous world and yet we're kind of tossed into this primitive world. So it's primitive and glamorous and um, of course, sexy. Uh, I like that sense of, you know, where uh, we, we, we have to dress up and be, you know, uh, kind of like a, a love hate person, you know, where we, we have to walk tall and be, um, you know, elegant, but really deep down inside, we're just, you know, regular people. And next. Oh, and this is yeah, just a video we made. It's, it's called um, Clay La uh, Catan Lady Mother of Pearl. And it's, and it's like this dancing shape and um, you know, kind of like feathering out different colors and, and then, you know, strikes of lightning. And, and Lauren Roser uh, did the animation and we worked very hard on this. So um, thank you so much for the opportunity. Yes, thank you for sharing. I, I was curious, like one of the works said oven is I don't know if that was just a, a note of this one of an install on here. Is that? Oh, it's just, uh, it's an installation because it's like a kiln and oven, you know, it's, it, I wanted to show that it, it, it was like a real object. It's not mm -hmm. painted or whatever. And, and um, it has different um, dimensions. So when I when I look at these, they're 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 like very um, playful, you know. They they have a, like they create a little stage, and uh, and and painting is like a stage for me. You know, you get a little box, and you put things around it, and you move them around, and it's it's just like a like a magical uh, magic box where you can you can have all kinds of. Uh, you know, things that you don't expect. Yeah, so the, the right, that's, that's three-dimensional. It, it's almost yeah, like, yeah. yeah. Almost, and, and, you know, and then I put the American flag in because I felt that, again, people see us and they don't know where we're from. And they said, wow, you're Americans, but why not? Thank you. Are these like taking, do you often take or use your own personal jewelry in some of your sculptural works? Oh, sure. Maybe. Sure. Thank you. And we can go right on to Lauren has a couple of animations Thanks. as well here. Um, okay. Coming. Oh. <laughs> This one doesn't have sound, right? Um, I don't think no. so. No. No. I'll go ahead and play it. Wait, can so you play that again? Is that a gem underneath it? Like one of the gems we saw in Nina's? Oh no. Well, it's a, it's a CGI gem, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. So do you see um, these like collages together? 
and you're so we do sometimes yes um this this piece is about dissolution and integration and we were thinking about it's an allegory imagining recovery after society's been torn down by the pandemic and trying mm -hmm. to just envision how something could come together from pieces and reconvene itself and become similar to what it was, I guess, before, and hopefully better than it was before. Um, so this uh, instrument, it's, this piece is called Jupe for Jupiter. And um, I, in a rummage, a church rummage sale, I got this device, I'm a musician as well. And there's only 2000 of them left in the world. Um, it's a, a Japanese device from the 80s. So I'm very attached to this particular instrument. But I was thinking, you know, how, how we have to reconstruct this world at the end of the, as the pandemic tapers down. And it's called Jupiter, the, the piece is called Jupiter, but is the model also called Jupiter? Yeah, yes. the planet. Oh, I, I was wondering if the, the synth model had like the name Jupiter. And yes, no, yes, no, it does. Not really. It's a heading keyboard. You want me to go to the next one? Sure. This one does have sound. <laughs> Um, this also, also has to do with dissolution and disintegration, but here I was thinking about the disintegration caused by global warming, how everything was, has been set up and, and things get out of balance and then they just fade away. Um, I'm really influenced by Fluxus. I was influenced by an artist named Shari Deans, who always tried to use a lot of elements of chance in her work to sort of take the, the artist ego out of the work. So I'm also working in, in the computer using a lot of physical simulators and um, things that, that create imperfection and a greater sense of realism because of that imperfection. Um, in my music, I like to use glitch a lot because it, it creates um, a greater sense a variety and a sort of analog goodness to it. So again, thank you for letting us show our work. Yeah, I also love to use um, trans operations in my work. It's it's one of the most like liberating things I feel like I've found that I'm able to do to keep generating and surprising myself. So I also like how, I mean, you could say this is kind of another example of chance in a way coming across. Yeah, it's using physical mathematics to create the, the disintegration. Yeah. And the chance that you you happen to come across it at you said you found it at a yard sale? Yeah. Oh, oh no. It was it was actually uh, used for church music. Oh yeah. It was a church rummage sale. No. Oh okay. You're playing music outside. That's so cool. Thank you so much, Lauren. Thank you. Thank you. So next we have Scott. Hi, um, my name is Scott. It's great to meet all of you. Uh, and thanks again, Kristen, for, for having me and having all of us, giving us the opportunity. <laughs> Um, so yeah, let's jump right in. Um, um, okay, so the first like painting that I included was like more of like a reference point. It'll make kind of more sense as you like see the, the other works. Um, but like the main idea with these, and I've been making these for like a long time and it's pretty much like all the same like uh, technique is just like, these very gestural lines that you start with and then you just sort of like connect them and end up justifying them over like the course of like 
because these are more meditative, like the stuff that I would really like think of exhibiting is more of like the, the computer stuff, like the, like the 3D, like the AI generated stuff. But um, this one is more, um, this technique is just like sort of um, creating these gestural lines and spent like taking a lot of time with them and just like sort of adding layers of depth and dimension over like the course of like many months. And then just, I think like the contrast uh, of like the square to the, to like the, this sort of like more quantum object, like this like sort of like a fourth dimensional creature or something. And I, this is a little bit off. I didn't, I couldn't take a picture of this in time, but this one, the bigger one, um, I don't know if you can see all of it, but it's a big sword going through that one. And there's like a lot of gibberish written around. I do a lot of stuff with gibberish. There's also these people who are trying to drink soda water that's coming out. But um, yeah, we can go to the next one. Um, uh, yeah, so these are older. These have nothing to do with the, um, because the one before is called Bible Child. Um, and this one was, uh, these are like two excerpts from a photo series I did a long time ago. And believe it or not, there's no edits on any of like the pictures from these. These are all in camera. Um, but uh, yeah, so this was like part three. Um, these are excerpts from like the third act of this larger photo series. Um, and this is called Rebirth. Uh, the whole thing was like, birth after birth and rebirth and uh this was a sort of the third stage and it kind of goes with the the more um 3d stuff we can go to the next slide we, we can do the next one hello <laughs> hey kristen Oh, I think Kristen's thing might have um, crashed or something because she's not, I don't think she's in the chat right now. Um, well, let me see. Well, I guess I'll just talk a, a few more minutes about these. Um, but uh, yeah, so the, um, oh yeah, I think she's like fully out of the chat. Um, but yeah, so um, I don't know if I can share my screen. But uh, yeah, so that was like a photo series I did a while ago and it was all underwater. Um, There's like a waterproof cameras and stuff. And the first uh, sort of two acts were, were more observable. Um, it's really weird. Um, Cause like when the, wa like when the, when the camera shooting something that close, like a bubble with like that small, of like a frame rate, you really get like, this almost like superposition of like multiple objects at the same time. Like when you're working with like, uh, water for film or um, or for photos and I think photo is really appropriate as like a means to discuss um, sort of like entropy when it comes to water because you just sort of get this cross section of time uh, in like this closed system and um, and so I mean the whole thing was sort of just like about energy analysis. hey hey guys I'm so sorry I am now on a hot on a hot spot so oh no don't worry that won't happen again. Oh, no, no worries. I, I, I like chit chat. Um, little jibber jabber never hurt anybody. Um, <laughs> Wait. No, this is really left off, right? Oh, is this the next one? I think this uh, might have been it. You want me to go um, back? Is that, oh, I just, uh, I think, I think that might be the next one. It's okay. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, is that the, the one after or? Yeah, this is. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. The, no, we can just go to the one before. Sorry. Um, so these are sort of getting into the 3D stuff, which is like stuff I'm like kind of more into. Um, so like the, the sort of goal behind these is like work that can only exist in a digital space. So it's like if you were to try to print this work or if you were trying to like have this work exhibit like in like a physical context, it just it just doesn't make any sense. So it's like um, these objects that are sort of specific to this new sort of digital environment that we're all sort of creating and sort of defining without even know it. Um, so like above it, you see like suspended text of like um, sort of a hyperlink and just sort of like uh, these sort of more randomized characters that sort of indicate um, sort of the passage of information. And um, so the, the ultimate goal with these was to have like an accompanying uh, like text poetry book that was like basically these 3D models extruded into like the base source code that's like communicating this depth um this depth map to the to the to the rendering program um but we can go to the next one 
Um, and um, so this one's called uh, Passion According to St. Christopher. Um, and I, I did this, uh, I did this scan at the Bowery Hotel. I, li I live uh, like that area. And I did a sketch at this like really fancy hotel. And um, there was a point, there was a point to that. I forget it. Um, we can just go to the next one. Um, and, um, but yeah, the, the, the sort of goal behind all of these is like, um, just like this one's called Amber and, um, just sort of create this consistent sort of like, um, a better way to describe, I think piggybacking off what Lauren said about like the, the analog sort of imperfections and sort of adding this sort of dimension and this like quality to this sort of parameterized medium. So it's like, you know, you have like new media is like a lot of it is just people who are really good with computers and they sort of like what's missed is sort of like the sort of human interaction with these systems and uh so like my like broader interest i'm like getting into tech and everything and user interface design user experience design and so sort of like these as like a contrast to like me learning about how to like serve uh like um true um but like uh, how you can like sort of serve a, a user's needs but these are like the opposite where it's like making as making like the actual base reality of the image is incomprehensible to the to the user as possible so it's like i use a lot of gibberish and like a lot of like a lot of like the 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 sort of deconstruction of language too um to like sort of show like this sort of large entropy that's happening on like a cultural level but um we can go to the next one And this is just another one uh, from the series. Uh, and these are like, so, I mean, like I've been getting really into crypto and I mean, I know it's a big groan at this point, uh, but like, uh, you know, these sort of objects are sort of, um, well, so uh, the, actually it's a great question. Um, these, so I have a, a partner friend that I've been working with for, for a while now. Um, and uh, we're thinking about actually like printing um, like large scale versions of these that would hang from the ceiling. And so you'll get a better idea of what these look like in a three-dimensional context. But like, we're thinking about building these like 18 feet wide. And I know the whole point is to sort of like, they are only meant to be exhibited in a digital space. Um, but the larger sort of point of this, so if you remember like the first painting um, and how like, so the idea is kind of like, if you were to see this object in person as like somebody with no information, and then you were to try to sketch that object from memory, like the paintings would be like the result so it's like you sort of have this like Rene Marguerite like treachery of images sort of vibe where it's like this is not the pipe this is like the image of the pipe and it's like um sort of the larger sort of idea behind like the work and like layers of images and like especially like in the, the current condition is like you're looking at your social media feed and it's like you you see a, your a picture of your friend you're like oh that's my friend not like that's an image of my friend that's like a doc that's like a intentionally performed for sort of documented event. And I'm, I don't know, that's sort of what the vibe of the work is. But um, we can go to the next one. Oh, I think this one's a video. This is like a better idea of like what it looks like. It's like an old export. And the ridges are sort of like, you, this would be very difficult to do in person. Thank you so much. Avery. Um, but uh, yeah, so I mean, the, the detail is important because I kind of feel like you get the, the vibe that this is like, this is like one point deep at like every point. So like, you know, actually printing this out and it's like some parts. Um, oh, that's a good question. Um, that's a yeah. really good question, actually. Um, uh, that's, that's something I got to think about. Uh, I would definitely call myself a digital artist. Like all this stuff I've exhibited up to now, which is not a lot. I've Wait, only done one. No, you got, before you answer, can you repeat it? Because I didn't see it in my chat. Oh, my bad. Um, so Doug asked, if, if a critic were to put you in a category, would you? Oh, that's the whole goal. Thank you, Regina. I appreciate that. It's like making work honest to the time we live in. But, uh, you know, uh, so the, the question was, uh, was uh, if I were, if a critic were to put you in a category, would you want them to call you a digital artist or a painting painter working electronically? Um, that's like a really good, I would, I would say it's like post internet. I know that's also a groan, um, but like, uh, you know, making work that's like 
sort of in continuity with this like large method of distributing images you know what i mean and so the the sort of flip side of that is like something called digital diatritus which is like the waste of all of these sort of digital transactions and so um the work that i showed that i didn't include any images from um this summer was like these simulated browser environments so the work that was actually in the gallery was just these big qr codes and um and so like Basically, I almost died in this car accident like a long time ago. And I just went into like the inspect element on like GoFundMe pages and like Facebook.com articles about like, you know, car crashes and like traffic articles and all this stuff. And I rewrote it as if like I had died in the accident. And then like three years later, I had like put together this like sort of showing of these like simulated browser environments, but I had like made all the text gibberish. So it's like the longer you read it, the less comprehensible it actually was until it was just like characters and just like letters. Really and like, like there was, what is you're that? Bit, you're a fake obituary. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, not- yeah, that was the summer. Krista was there. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I'm glad you included a video too because like, so we could see how dimensional those ones yeah. are. But also, yeah, to um, Andrea's, point her comment looks like an ultrasound almost so much technology but also fleshy and I think she was referring to this particular one maybe but also yeah I mean you look back at this one like and you're talking about birth and rebirth and you know I think you might be it might be kind of paintings kind of are conversation with these glitch like my computer saw me I don't know what you heard from that but I was I was oh yeah no I heard the um, end comment about yeah and um I was gonna add something else before I got distracted but yeah no it's it's great too to hear like about the the birth and rebirth point because I mean from what a lot of your stuff I'd seen was Scott did these like um, 3D like scan like portraits of like either like two subjects or subjects that you know the ones where it's like you're the 360 scan yeah these weird like yeah. kind of like three dimensional objects so to see these eventually like in in a sculptural form to be really cool with your paintings also like on exhibit Thank you. i don't know if that's your plan but from, well, from what you know. i like that a lot uh the the main thing uh and just like the two things uh really about like of note i think are like um like the whole point is like when you're scanning it to like confuse the 3d scanner as much as possible to create those sort of imperfections that lauren was talking about earlier that sort of add like a dimension to this otherwise very computer and very sort of like um sort of square pushing kind of medium at times um and so i mean I, exhibiting this um um is like and it's, that was to uh, doug's last comment which was technologically we will soon see walls that can display tv or digital art as a sort of decor so what what, what i'm really working on is like these hologram fans so they just have leds that are on the strips of these fans and so if you sort of interpolate the the video you saw earlier of the spinning 3D model. And so you just sort of get these sort of like, if you have like 10 of these hologram fans that are just like spinning Mm -hmm. and showing like the 3D work, um, you know, you, and then you have them sort of interpolated like a little bit at a time, Um, like you just get like time refraction. Um, But, uh, and as, and the last one was Regina's comment, your death sounds like you are starting out cognitively intact and then descend into a trip. Exactly. And I mean, the first one's called goodbye of like the exhibited work and the last one's called hello. And like the whole thing is about like identity being reduced to a data point um, uh, that's like just sort of being pushed around by an advertiser. Um, but that's sort of the, the bigger thesis. Thank you so much, Kristen, for having me. Um, Thank you. Like, oh, okay. VR would be awesome. That's true. true. We have um, um, about like 20, 25 minutes left um, and We'll go on to Elsa. I think we have four Hello. more. So, hi, Elsa. Can you hear me well? Yeah, yeah. Sure. Uh, so, thank you uh, again for 
for I'm happy to be here and happy to have found this. Uh, I just arrived to New York a month ago for the first time, so I'm happy to see people doing art around here. Uh, I'm a photographer and I'm from Gothenburg, Sweden, and I moved to Paris when I was 19 after like graduating high school. And there I met Yej Engström, who's a Swedish photographer as well, and I started assisting his work and he became like a mentor and a teacher to me ever since. So that's sort of like how I learned photography but also by just like shooting all the time. And uh, that's pretty much my method. I'm working with photography as a sort of journal or diary. And yeah, I think it's a way for me to like kind of process what is going on around me. And like just the move to Paris where like relationships, friends, jobs and everything felt kind of temporary. Photography became like a way to keep or save uh, things that I lived. And I don't really have like a present for each representation uh, for each picture. So we can just like go, go around, I guess. And uh, due to my method of like photographing all the time, I sometimes like question how present I am in the actual moment, seeing it all the time for a lens or thinking of a potential photograph instead of like just living it. But in a way, I feel like that is the most present I can be because it's about like constant seeing and watching and being aware of, of what is around me. And uh, I think it's also interesting to see, you can go on to the next if you want. This is my mom and my sister. And I think it's interesting to see how like private can meet public and I've got the advice to, to like the more specific and personal you are uh, the more like universal and relatable it can become to an audience or a viewer. And it's also like the people around me that interest me uh, the most. I do not like create settings from a vision or a fantasy or I don't like read fantasy books either. Like to me, it's like reality or at least like my perception of reality is uh, enough. And move on. And to me, the approach to the people I photograph, it's like very important and central to like access them, trusting me uh, to photograph them. And, uh, and I think that's very central to get a good portrait. And it's not, in a way, it's not really complicated because there's a quote from a Diane Abras documentary uh, stating that like to ask someone for their portrait that they often say yes also because for a lot of people they want to be paid that much attention and that is a reasonable amount of attention to be paid and I come back to that quote sometimes thinking about approaching people to photograph and you can go to the next one uh, yeah and then to the next one because I don't have much more to say like more than sum it up I think my work is like but quite banal life questions and intimacy and like coming close or longing to come close. And yeah, that's, that's about it. Uh, I'm not mistaken, your mentor lived in US when he came. He lived in New York City for a while. Yeah, in the 90s. That is the quote says photography freezes memory. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Thank you so much. Beautiful work. Thank you. We'll go to Jonathan. So um, hi Christine. Thank you so much for inviting me. And I'm especially grateful to Doug, whom I spoke to two days ago and who reassured me to connect connect with you. And ever since then, you've been very, very uh, attentive and very responsive. I am a self-taught photographer, and uh, initially I wondered what I was doing here. But then when I realized, having talked to Doug and talked to you, that you are non-judgmental, it goes back to the very basic principle that art builds bridges between people. I'm a pathologist. 
and I've never taken a course in photography. And in fact, I don't like carrying cameras. But as an individual who is beset by a lot of misinformation, etc., brought on by 6,500 languages, I tend to I tend to concentrate on the most important language, which is the language of empathy, the language that allows us to be good listeners. I am fortunate to have uh, participated in many celebratory uh, uh, inclusions where inanimate, animate as well as abstract subjects come to attention. And uh, in doing that, I tend to not type cast myself in any particular role. I love architecture, not just because it, it allows us to interrelate with light, but also because the same way we approach a cathedral is the way we approach a bacterium under the microscope with humility and respect. And uh, I, the, this particular uh, selection is called Serenity. And it draws attention to the fact that one sky canopies the entire human race. And uh, in looking at these trees with very scant leaves and also with bent uh, architecture, it reminds us of what the environment can do and what the occupiers of the environment can adapt to. Uh, this is uh, from Ethiopia where the uh, environment is very dry and these trees have survived by resilience and also by adaptation. The next slide, please. I call this field of gold for a given reason. When you look at it, water connects all cultures on earth. By the same token, as I said, the same sky canopies all of us as a blanket. But what draws attention to me in in terms of this photograph, is that it's not about pixels. It's about the light, the streak of light, which represents the soul of every one of us. And when you look at the secondary illumination, which helps see the entire background, it reminds me of how this light, which is intrinsic, if shared with the environment and with our neighbors, can allow a few square miles of of territory where you have big blocks of cement and, and, and glass panes transformed into a neighborhood of 109, over 190 cultures living at peace with one another. And that is also a reflection of empathy and listening to each other. Next one. And I call this field of gold because of that. Uh, because because of that, I look beyond the fact that it is a township, I mean, a city, but really it is a reflection of the human, of all of us. I value this immensely because it's very uplifting. The title is Standing Tall, and the reason being that in Standing Tall, whatever pride and heritage is adorned with unconditional hospitality, the joy of sharing gets manifested. Powwows are experiences I always look forward to. In doing so, I stand tall with all the celebrants and share their joy. The next one, please. Okay, I had a wrong one. Okay, Fulani Maiden. When you look at the fact that wherever you share your culture, it's like synergy. Two plus two is equal to five. It can be very boring sharing your culture with just yourself, but when you're sharing it with somebody other than yourself, you synergize. This lady, a Fulani lady, is carrying a receptacle made of calabash and carved uh, actually for uh, in different uh, forms. It's a question of expression. This receptacle is used to carry milk, but the dress she's wearing is hand woven. Her hair is also hand braided. But what touched me about this is that the Fulani language goes across all of the 16 countries of West Africa. It's spoken in all 16 countries. And it, it draws attention to the fact too that in sharing this culture with a different person, you get synergy. The next one, please. Binta Kinte was a, actually an expression of serendipity. 
uh, I was touched by the by the Roots documentary, which was written by uh, uh, based on a book written by Alex Ellie, and I took a plane from Newark to Jufore in search of landmarks, and uh, these are landmarks to include with a, a self-driven mission of capturing all necessary historical landmarks, especially those of uh, of importance and contribution in all historically black colleges and universities. And this was in the early 80s. And I arrived in Jufra very disappointed by the fact that there is nothing saying, welcome to the home of Bintakinte. So I sought a different alternative and this was what I chose, the landmark, a human face, which is a landmark of God. And in seeing this, I saw a woman, regardless of where she came from, because all women bear all of us, maintain societies, and actually carry out their role without asking for much, and they're generally unsung heroes. Next one, please. Okay, here is a a landmark, a natural in Silberg, a natural landmark in central Nigeria. And I was touched by the fact that the land, uh, man-made uh, huts, the, the tone, the earth tone, as far as the texture, almost correlates with the main, main, uh, with the main in Silberg. But I also want to draw attention to the fact that uh, the the face, the human face, which is actually etched, like the closer you go to it, the more you look, you know that it's a human face. It's a, uh, something that draws attention to tourists. Uh, S S Suleja is 10 miles from Abuja, the capital of Nigeria, the most uh, populous country in Africa, in all of 54 African countries. Next, please. Right. And thank you so much. And in doing so, I would like to especially thank, uh, appreciate Christine once more and Doug, but most importantly, I want to appreciate all the other participants, especially those who shared their thoughts of travel and also the value of serendipity. Thanks. I'm Jonathan Woos. Thank you so much, Jonathan. I, I love what you said about the, the language of empathy. We could all use more empathy in this world. Um, and some comments too from from Doug. This photo is a painting. Remarkable how the shape of the rocks uh, is so like the shape of the huts. And I was thinking that too with the colors, and I'm seeing different faces in there too. So thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for inviting me. I can't believe you're self-taught there. Gorgeous photos. Next Thank we you. have yes, next we have Mark. Mark Joslov. Is Mark still with us? Okay, I'm unmuted now. <laughs> okay. Hi. Uh, it's been a hi. It's been a pleasure to uh, share the evening with uh, fellow artists. I want to thank ATOA also for doing this all the time. It's really uh, a legacy. Um, I don't want to take too long because I know we only have about five minutes left and you still have to get to two artists, but I'll try to keep it brief. This is my very neat studio down in the basement. Uh, it provides all my needs for the mural project that I'm working on for the Freeport Memorial Library, which involves um, three periods of time, one from 1670 to 1870, and then from 1870 to 1970 on the second panel, and finally the uh, Freeport from 1970 to the current time. So it was a tremendous challenge. It's very daunting. I have to get all of these elements representing that period of time in the village history. And my natural way is to kind of abstract. And uh, it's almost, in some cases, it looks a little impressionistic or expressionistic or Japanese woodcut. It's a blending of all the things that I love, and yet I still have to have it be representational or else people won't know what the heck they're looking at. And it is kind of a document of the village history. But 
I want each panel to capture the feeling of the culture at that particular, that particular time. So um, what this shows is my thrift shop containers. I buy a dozen of them. I mix up my colors and the caps are on to keep them uh, sealed. Those are acrylic paints inside. Generally, I work on watercolor, but in this case, I'm using the acrylics. And it's on, it's on aluminum. Each panel is um, about an eighth of an inch thick aluminum, two feet by four feet for durability. And, um, and it's wor I think it's working for me, but it is scary. Uh, I can't believe how many days I procrastinate. So I'll, I'll work on it later because I am almost doing this in a, an illustrational way. So I have to be very careful. I can't just do it for myself. Next slide, please. So that's the finished panel one. Notice it's monochromatic. It's kind of a purplish black. And I felt that, oh no, this is the layout. Excuse me, it's my marker layout that I work from. Uh, these are um, about one foot wide. And uh, I refer to them as I do the finals. And this obviously represents Freeport from 1670 to 17, uh, to 1870 rather. And let's go to the next one. This is the middle panel. These were done with magic marker, um, a little bit of colored pencil. So this is my compositional reference point. The idea is to get a sweeping feeling on the bottom, have it rise up on the sides and and have a lot of white space in the upper half so it doesn't get, uh, so it doesn't scream too much. But it represents architecture and celebrated people and common and regular families in our history, our long history. The gentleman on the left is the Cisco Kids sidekick, Leo Carrillo, Pancho. And the woman on the right is the, one of the first educators in Freeport, Carolyn Atkinson after whom a school, has, a school has been named. And then you've got a thespian. And, but when I met with the board, they would tell me, no, we can't have this. We can't have that. Uh, we don't want the mayor in there because that would be um, showing a certain uh, uh, leaning on a particular person. I had to take out any of the businesses that, uh, that are still around today because that would be unfair competition. I mean, there were so many things that caused me to re reconstruct some of it. Next one. And this would be the contemporary Freeport. You could see some of the stores there and the mayor in the lower left and uh, the lower right all had to be scratched out. Um, so let's go to the finals. And that, that's my uh, interpretation of the first layout. Um, and it's a little bit too much lit, lit up in the photograph on the right. The right is as dark as the left is. So you get that swooping uh, feeling. You can see some of the oyster fishermen in the background and the early sailing ships and the mills, the old mill, horse-drawn carriage, uh, a, f a family with, with a personal farm, a uh, Civil War veteran. So it was very daunting to put all of these disparate elements together into one, try to make it cohesive. I don't know if I succeeded or not, but I'm doing my best. Next how, one. How large, how large are these intended four to be? Feet, four feet wide and two feet high on the finals. Okay. So the whole mural will be side by side. It will be uh, 12 feet plus. To give it and with where will it be, where will it be installed? It's inside the Freeport Memorial Library. Um, Okay. The space that you walk into in the reference section. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody will see it. I originally wanted it for the outside on the exterior and I plan to do um, uh, digital enlargements on film that would be um, resistant to weather and enjoy the, uh, the so this is gonna, This is Freeport, Long Island you're speaking yes, of? Yes, it is, yeah, yeah. Will, the, will these, I work in acrylic myself, will these be protected by uh, a coat of, of varnish? Yes. Okay. Yes, as a matter of fact, I use um, acrylic medium with the paints. 
uh, so I could glaze over colors, which is what I do a lot with watercolor. And I decide, why can't I do that with the acrylic? So if I want to lighten something up, I'll glaze over with a little bit of uh, white, maybe add a little bit of that um, uh, tan color to it. And then I take it down a notch so it doesn't scream as much. So I, I'm constantly glazing and, and pushing the values or taking them down or adding extra colors. Uh, this, this is about 80, 80, 85% finished right now. Well, with acrylic varnish, you have a choice of matte, semi-gloss, and yes. gloss. Right. So I, I use a, a, a liquid acrylic. The, the varnish is um, it's, uh, matte, and then I go over the whole thing when it's finished with uh, either satin or gloss. I think satin, so I don't want it to be too um, difficult to view from the side if the lights are on it. So I'm not going to add the final coat of varnish until the end when I'm all done. Let's see, are there any other questions? Okay. Just scrolling through the chat here. Yeah, I'm still trying to get that. Yes, Freeport, New York. There is no Freeport, New Jersey. There is a free port in Maine though. And there's, yeah. one, there's one in the Midwest too on the, on the North Coast and it may be um, Indiana, I don't know. Mark, when will these be installed? Well, fortunately they didn't give me a deadline on it which, which is getting in the monkey off my back kind of. But I'm assuming at the rate I'm going, it'll be done in August or September. And then we'll have so it. Unveiling. Will you know? Yeah, would you let us know? Because I live on Long Island. I'd love to go. Uh, who should I s submit the uh, invitation to? Edith Brown. Edith Brown. And uh, yeah, I would love to. How will I get your email, Edith? Can you put it on the chat, maybe? Yes, I will. Uh, yeah, I'll, 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 I'll pass. Regina I'll, made. Um, a nice critical point here. Please don't hide the history that took place before your panel one. We conquered and enslaved and murdered and pushed out, especially for the library. Yeah, it's very common for people these days to forget their history, their heritage. So I thought, you know, before I die, let me leave a legacy, you know, so that people after me, if they're interested, they'll have it all in front of them and there will be legends on the side that describe each element in the uh, mural. Yeah, I think she was describing before we get to like panel one, if there's a possibility of adding a panel that represents the Native Americans that we- That represents what? I'm not hearing you, Kristen. The Native Americans who were here before us. There weren't, and, any, there weren't any in Freeport. In Freeport. I researched that. They would have been in there, not in Freeport. It would have been nearby villages. Well, thank you so much for sharing. They're such full compositions here. There's so much to look at. So, yeah, thank you, Mark. Thank you. Um, thank you, comments. Um, I don't think Marina is here. Marina, or sorry, Mariana. Yes, I'm. I'm here, and yeah. yes, Hi. thank you. Thank you very much for the for the invitation. Uh, I'm from Chile. I'm an artist from Chile. I'm an artist and a designer. I live in Santiago and I, I visit uh, several times New York and now I'm here. Thank you. I'm, Thank a, you. I'm a paper artist and oh. yeah, I, in my work, I always try to, to connect with nature and I work with, with fibers and um, I always believe that paper is part of our life, and um, and I try to sh to 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 show uh, how the details became important in in life. All my my art could be next one next. All my my work is about the details, and this is um, a dress that it, it's it was from a, an exhibition. Um, from a, a, a dress 
only with paper, and it was in, in the um, uh, 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 Atlanta airport because I, I collaborate with the paper museum in, in, in Atlanta. And um, everything is about mixing papers. And I, I have my studio in, in Santiago and I make the paper and, and I um, put little details from, from nature. Next, please. This is this is um, with with the recycle, uh, little recycling things, and and the size is um, one met one meter, if uh, to one and a half. It's it's um, uh, it's paper, and it's it's mixed with the um, uh, how do you say plumas um, pears. Perez. Perez. Yes, and uh, there, there, there was like um, um, it was a party, and and we took the the purse from from the party, and I I decide to make um, a, a piece of art. Always I recycle things that they are going to to go to to um, not to use. And um, I like to show that, that you can you can use like uh, recycling things from inside to outside. I I teach in the university and I teach inside the jail. In a process that that calls like re recycling inside, and it's it's a way like when you recycle inside, you can see the recycling outside. The, next, please. Sorry. Sorry, it's loading here. Oh, yeah, that's your last. Ah, uh, yeah. This this is paper, a uh, handmade paper that I make, and with a, a lot of little little uh, things that it's like everyday things, like little buttons, little little um, brands, um, and. Um, it's it's like expression of like every everything has their own personality, but all together make a big things and and contribute like a like a group of of people like a group of things and um, that's always my my idea like to show that how little things goes all together. This is big. This is um, like uh, two meters for three meters. I, I don't know if this is the last one or there is another. Um, okay. Is that a photo um, in this part with the, is it a combination of photographs or is that an actual like leaf on there too with the paper? It's, it's a, no, it's like little things that, that uh, it's, it's, it's not the, probably the photo is not very clear but uh, it's it's handmade paper and like little things from nature. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank Do you, you have a website? Uh, uh, I I I have my my Instagram that is uh, like like uh, Mariana Kaplun with 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 uh, K. Can you put it on the chat on the chat? Please? Yes. Yes. Thank you. It'd be great too if everyone wants to share their website in the chat. Yeah, please feel free to share your sites and socials and everything. So last we have Josh. Thank you for patiently waiting for time. Hi, yeah, thank you, Kristen, for organizing this. Um, I really, really appreciate it. And thank you all the other artists for showing your work today. There's been a lot of really, really cool and um, uh, beautiful things shown. Um, so my name is Josh Urban Davis. Um, I work in emerging media. Uh, what that means is I often sometimes make things by hand and sometimes I build um, small programs and computers to help me make things. Um, I started making work this way because I used to have a painting practice once upon a time, but uh, due to certain circumstances, I was moving around a lot and I couldn't have a dedicated studio space anymore. 
So I had a brief four way into being a poet, um, but the poet lifestyle is a little too intense for me. So I now make uh, emerging media artwork because my computer is now my studio. Uh, and I like this process because it allows me to invent my own paintbrushes um, and they can do anything I want, which I think is fun and exciting. Um, and these two particular works shown right here, um, it's, a, it's a technique called slit scanning. What essentially I've done is I've taken two works by other artists and I've taken a row of the pixels on the image and I've copied them all the way down the page. And what I was interested in examining here is there's this, um, there's this mythos about copyright uh, that an image uh, uh, can be considered to have an original owner if it is 30% different uh, from uh, the original. And so what I found interesting is I could use, I could write a small program to actually calculate how different an image is. And these are both 30% different than the original. Um, so I'm wondering if this, uh, the question I kind of wanted to pose here is um, who do these belong to? Are these original images? Are these mine? Do these belong to the artist? Um, these are about appropriation and theft. Next slide, please. Uh, so those were some very recent experiments that might grow into a larger body of work. This is from a different body of work that's ongoing where I'm designing um, and building my own tarot deck. Um, there's a rich tradition of queer artists um, who make tarot deck, Pamela Coleman Smith, most notably making the Rider Waite Smith deck um, and uh, Frida Harris, who um, was also a queer woman who designed the deck for Aleister Crowley, who was famously queer. Um, and I, uh, I find just tarot to be a very interesting art form that kind of lives in people's homes and they examine it as a means of reflection and examination. And uh, I like the interactivity and the social component that kind of comes with these, with developing these images. Um, next slide, please. So these are some much, much older artworks. Um, this is more typically of the kind of stuff um, uh, that I make. Um, the one on the left is called Mysterious Forces at Work, Mysterious Forces at Play. The one on the right is called A Sudden Rush of Blood to the Skin. Um, uh, what I like to think about with these kind of images is that we think that things on the internet, um, images that we have on the internet are going to live forever. Um, and that's not true. Um, links rot, bit shift operators throw things off, they create glitches, um, images decay over time. Um, and so actually these images that we have online, they, they, they don't actually live forever. Um, they, they, they rot and they wilt just like flowers do. Um, they're living things too in this way. Next slide, please. Um, the one on the right is called, uh, the one on the right is called I am skinless in a limo. And the one on the left, I think, is a detail from a piece called Violence. Um, uh, a couple of things that I like working with flowers. I work a lot with flowers, if you haven't noticed. Um, I think there's a lot. I think there's such a loaded image that's really cool. They, they're kind of a stand-in for the body in a lot of ways because they're so delicate. They're so fragile. They, um, they fade and they, um, uh, they often can wilt away. Um, uh, and there's also something about glitching them that's interesting to me. It's specifically queer in the way that it kind of um, corrupts this very loaded image in a very intentional way. Um, uh, next slide, please. Um, and I think this one is called The Space Between Two Bodies is a Body Too. Um, uh, I think that uh, oftentimes, you know, a lot of these images um, landscape painting kind of came into fashion and um, even still lifes came into fashion um, at one point in time during the industrial revolution because people were now surrounded all the time by machinery, um, uh, constantly surrounded by machinery. And so they wanted to have these paintings to kind of serve as a kind of escape um, from the machinery that's constantly around them back to nature. And now we're so constantly surrounded by machines all the time. I like, uh, I like, creating these images that have a visual reminder um, of the kind of machines that are around us at all times, even in the way that we interact and perceive nature. 
Um, I know that we're very well over time. Um, I don't, um, I want to keep this very brief, um, but again, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time and attention. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. And yes, we did end up going quite over time today. So thanks everyone for sticking around. And again, a special thanks to all the artists that showed today. Um, We'll say all your names again. It's in the group. Jacqueline, Sarah Rada, Timothy Hall, Andre Amarok, Nina Quo, Will Rosser, Scott Keen, Russell Hemmerin, Jonathan Rosu, Mark Josloff, Mariana Kaplan, and Josh Davis. Thank you everyone so much. Um, just gonna look through the chat here, see if I missed anything. I don't know if Doug has any additional announcements. Um, I, I have no real announcement except thank you, Kristen. That's my big announcement. That's the one I was looking for. Thank you so and much. Hope, and I thank hope you very that, much. Uh, thank you. I hope that you join us all in the fall. We'll be back well, after Labor Day. Thank you. Thank you. We'll, we'll send you the updates. And yeah, I hope to see you again in the fall, guys. Look forward to it. Bye. Thanks so much. Bye. 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 Thank you.